like, bro. She got, she got a kid. Look at his back. Oh my god. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Bomb, man. Yeah, I never heard of him. Let me see. Uh, I just came across this dude uh, a few days ago. Really good you YouTube. He's, he's one of them YouTubers that when you, like, when you come across him, like, he just watch all their videos. Like, he got, like, scary videos, uh, paranormal type stuff. Like, mysteries. Like, people, they disappearing. Like, killers and serial killers, all that different stuff. But the way he tells the story, like, his voice isn't annoying. Like, he's like, number 10... She was in the room. I'm like, why are you talking like that? Bro, I just heard different dudes <laughs> talk like that. Like, why? It's like, like he has a regular normal voice. I think he was in the Navy SEALs too. So he's like, he knows like these kind of situations and what kind of stress it can bring on you and stuff like that. So he's able to bring that forth in the story. If you're a fan of Mr. Ballin, uh, stay tuned, man. We're gonna react to more of his stuff. Make, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to share us. We're to 10K subscribers, man. Subscribe to Mr. Bond, got great videos. We're gonna have ranches. We're gonna look at three unsolved mysteries. <laughs> that have lots of evidence, but no one can make sense of them. But before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right channel because that's all we do and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to make the like button a nice hot cup of coffee when they wake up and then proceed to make them an extremely weak and lukewarm cup of coffee with too much milk and too much splendor. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. In 1993, David Lewis was an accomplished lawyer living in Amarillo, Texas with his wife Karen and his nine-year-old daughter. He was known to be a devoted husband and father who spent much of his off time supporting various charitable causes. On January 28th of that year, Karen and their daughter decided to leave Amarillo and go to Dallas to spend the weekend shopping together. David, who would normally go with them, decided to stay home because he did not want to miss the Super Bowl, which was that Sunday, the 31st. So Karen and their daughter left, and then a couple of days later on the 31st, they returned to Amarillo, and they actually got back to their house right after the Super Bowl had ended. And so they anticipated going into the house and finding David either cleaning up after himself or maybe watching the post game. But when they walked in, the TV was still on and turned to the channel the Super Bowl had been on, but David was nowhere to be found. Karen noticed that the VCR was actually still recording. David was known to record all major sports games and watch them again, and so clearly he had not turned off the recording. As Karen walked around the house yelling for her husband, she wasn't that concerned. She figured he must have stepped out or something, but she went into the kitchen and she opened up the fridge and she found there was a plate with two freshly made turkey sandwiches on it, which was a sandwich David would often make. And she thought that was pretty weird that he would have made them and then let them sit inside the fridge. And so she closed the fridge and turned around and on the counter in the kitchen was his wedding band and his watch. And so even though there were all these kind of strange things that Karen was finding in the house, she really wasn't that concerned. There was no sign of forced entry. There was no sign the house had been burglarized. There was no sign of a struggle. And so she assumed her husband must have stepped out to watch the second half of the game at a friend's house and that he would be back later. And so Karen stayed up for a little while, but then ultimately she went to bed thinking he would be there in the morning. But the next morning when she got up, there was no sign of her husband, and so she went to the police. Within 24 hours, the police located David's abandoned car downtown near the courthouse. Under one of the car's floor mats, they located his car keys as well as his house keys. And then within the car, they found his checkbook, his credit cards, and his driver's license, all in the places they should be. They looked into his bank activity, and they saw there was a recent deposit for $5,000 into his family's account. They also saw that he recently purchased two plane tickets, one was from Los Angeles to Dallas, and the other was from Dallas to Amarillo, but it wasn't clear if he had used either of these tickets. When Karen was told about the found car and the strange bank activity, she told police that her husband had recently told her that he actually thought he might be in danger because he was scheduled to give a deposition in Dallas later that month in a conflict of interest case between his old law firm and a wealthy client. And David was being pressured to cover up some of the wrongdoings of his previous law firm, and he just wasn't willing to do that. He told his family that he was gonna tell the truth no matter who it hurt. David understood that put a huge target on his back. Yeah. While police were certainly intrigued at this new information, yeah, they didn't have any evidence to support the idea that someone was actively trying to that David. It was just a conspiracy. <laughs> and so for 11 months, 
months, they looked for new leads and new information, but nothing came out and David never popped up. He never called home. There was no sign of him. And so after 11 months, the police decided that David must have left of his own accord and that there was no foul play here. And so they closed the case. And after that, David's family, unfortunately, just had to accept the fact that he was gone and that more than likely no one was ever going to find him again. But in 2004, a state trooper in Washington state was on the Internet just researching unsolved mysteries. And he came across a picture of David Lewis. And immediately he recognized that he looked exactly like an unidentified victim of a hit and run case he covered back in 1993. And so he pulled up the details of this hit and run and he found the victim had been struck a day after David Lewis had gone missing. When this John Doe got hit, he was dressed head to toe in military clothing. He had no bags, he had no ID, and he was walking aimlessly down Highway 24 in Washington State, so 1,600 miles away from Amarillo, Texas, where David Lewis had gone missing. But despite the enormous distance between these two events, this trooper was convinced David Lewis was this John Doe. But as he's looking at the picture of David Lewis, he realizes he has glasses, and he didn't think the John Doe was wearing glasses. But just to be sure, he checked the belongings list of the John Doe, and it said he did have glasses. And it was the exact same kind that David was wearing in the picture. And eventually, DNA would confirm that and David Lewis was the over. John Doe. Now, this solved the mystery of where David Lucas Lewis went, see. but it did not solve the mystery of why he went there. Why did David go to Washington, a place where he has no ties? And if David was the one who hit record on his VCR on the night of the Super Bowl, that means he would have only had less than 24 hours to move 1,600 miles to Washington State without his car. And why was he wearing military clothing? Was that his clothing? Did he uh, buy I it? Said the whole thing wear it? Where was his luggage? Was he doing on my home watch the highway? David's assertions to his wife that his life was in danger, his demeanor as a loving family man, and the nature of his job as an attorney has many people, his family included, believing that he was the victim of foul play. But officially, the police have said David left the house of his own accord and his death was ruled an accident. In 2000, Mary Lou Morris was a 48-year-old loan officer at a Chase Bank in Houston, Texas. On the morning of October 12th, Mary Lou said goodbye to her husband, Jay, and she headed off to work. That afternoon, Jay gave his wife a phone call, but she didn't pick up. He left her a message, and she never got back to him. This was very unlike Mary Lou, and so Jay was a little bit concerned. At 5 p.m., when he still hadn't heard from her, Jay called her back, but again, she didn't pick up. So Jay called Mary Lou's supervisor, who informed Jay that Mary Lou had actually not come to work that day, and they couldn't get in touch with her either. Jay immediately knew something was wrong, and he called the police. The police had not even begun searching for her when a call came into the station from an ATV rider that happened to be on a road about three miles away from Mary Lou's house. And he said he spotted a smoldering car, and it looks like there's someone in the driver's seat that's obviously deceased. Earlier that day, at about 10 a.m., the fire department had gotten a call about smoke in that area, but they assumed it was a controlled burn, so they didn't investigate. When the police arrived on scene, it was impossible to tell who the person was that was sitting in the driver's seat, but they were able to find a tooth fragment, and they used that to confirm that it was, in fact, Mary Lou Morris. It was quickly determined that this was most likely a homicide, and her attacker had probably set this up to make it appear like it could have been self-inflicted. Gasoline had been poured all over Mary Lou and all over the vehicle. However, because of how badly damaged the car and she was, they couldn't determine a cause of death, so they weren't sure if she was deceased when she was placed in the car and it was lit on fire, or if she was in the car and the fire was the cause of death. A number of Mary Lou's valuables were still inside of the car, but her wedding ring was not on her finger. Mary Lou's family and the community at large were shocked. They just could not understand why anybody would want to target such a nice person that had no enemies. The day after Mary Lou's death, a local Houston newspaper received an anonymous call from a guy who just said, Mary Lou's death was an accident. And the newspaper tried to get more information, but the person hung up and they couldn't trace the call. At the same time this drama was unfolding for Mary Lou Morris, another drama was unfolding for another Houston woman with the same name. 39-year-old Mary McGinnis Morris was a successful nurse practitioner who by and large got along with all of her co-workers with one exception. A new employee at the clinic, a male nurse named Dwayne Young, was making her feel really uncomfortable. One day when Mary McGinnis got back to her desk, she found like all of her pictures can. of her family at the <laughs> 
had been flipped onto their faces, and in the middle of her desk was a piece of paper that just said, death to her. And she knew right away this had to be Dwayne, but she had no way to prove it. And so that night when she went home, she told her husband, Mike, about this guy, Dwayne, and she said, I don't feel safe at work. Can you teach me how to shoot a gun? And so he did. He taught her how to shoot a gun, and then he went out and got a pistol, and she tucked it under her driver's seat in her car just in case. On October 16th, so four days after Mary Lou Morris was found dead, and three days after that, she got on this phone call to the newspaper. Mary McGinnis Morris was at a drugstore after work, and as soon as she went inside, she noticed there was this strange man on the other side of the store that was just watching her. She called her best friend Lori to tell her that there was this strange guy and wanted to know what to do, and Lori said, you know, wait for him to leave. But the guy didn't leave. He just stayed in the store and stared at Mary. And so eventually, Mary said, you know what? I'm just going to pay for my stuff and get out of here. I got to stop by the office, but I'll be home in just a few minutes. I'll be totally fine. And so Mary hangs up. She buys what she needs. She leaves the store. And then 12 minutes later, she places a frantic 911 call saying someone's trying to kill her. And this 911 call was not made public because apparently on the tape, you can actually hear her being attacked. Mary McGinnis was found later that night in her car. She was deceased. She had a single gunshot wound to the head. It was clear from her 911 call that she had been attacked, and so this was almost certainly a homicide. However, her attacker tried to stage it so it looked like it was self-inflicted. The murder weapon, which was actually her pistol that was tucked underneath her seat, had been placed next to her hand on the seat next to her. None of Mary McGinnis's valuables were stolen. However, her wedding ring was missing from her finger. After Mary McGinnis Morris's death, people began to speculate that her death and Mary Lou Morris's death were connected. Specifically, this was a professional hit gone wrong. The reasoning for this theory is there was just too many coincidences. They shared the same name, they lived in the same city, they were killed within days of each other, and both of their deaths were staged to look like they were self-inflicted. And each woman was missing their wedding ring, which apparently is a common way for professional hitmen to let their clients know that the job was done. The people that subscribe to this theory believe Mary McGinnis Morris was the intended target and Mary Lou Morris was just an accident. And in fact, after killing Mary Lou Morris, the hitman must have realized, whoops, I made a mistake. And they called the newspaper to say, literally, that was a mistake. And then a couple of days later, the hit was successfully carried out on Mary McGinnis Morris. The police looked into this theory and they discovered that Mary McGinnis's husband, Mike, had recently accused her of cheating on him, and he was really, he really upset about it. He, he also refused to take a polygraph test Sorry. and would not allow his daughter to talk to the police. And Mary McGinnis had a $700,000 life insurance policy that Mike was in line to receive. And so immediately, everybody's like, okay, obviously Mike put a hit out on his wife, and that's what started this whole thing. But when they dug into it, they realized that no matter how upset Mike was, there wasn't any evidence that tied him to the killing of his wife or to Mary Lou Morris, and so he was ruled out as a suspect. As for Mary McGinnis's co-worker, Dwayne Young, who wrote Death to Her on her desk, it was clear that he did not like Mary, but he was ruled out as a suspect as well. And unfortunately, that's where both of these cases go cold. To date, no one's ever been charged. I should have picked a bit on him. Yeah, ones where he talked about, like, fucking cops coming to niggas' houses and fucking demons and shit. And the one he's talking about when fucking... He walked in. It was a black family, too. I was surprised. Fucking walked in. He said they immediately. These are like regular cops. Welcome to Rage. No one can just pause it. <laughs> Welcome to Rage Shadow Legends. Don't skip ad. Don't skip ad. Don't skip ad. I'm watching your family. Don't skip that ad. Anyway. What was I saying? Um, you were talking about the other videos, the cops and the demons. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, he walk into the house, and fucking, the son is, like, his fucking eyes start rolling to the back of the head, and, like, he started talking, like, get out, and shit, like, the way he's, like, talking, but it was, like, that, that Hollywood shit, and then, like, get out, and just fucking, what? <laughs> but she, the fucking grandma started praying over her and stuff, and he starts walking backwards away from her, starts walking up the wall. Mm. No. I'm done after that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not investigating. Now. I'm going. You might call out the squad, buddy, because I don't do this. Mm -hmm. That's that's ridiculous. But yeah, we probably should put you more. Paranormal, paranormal stuff. I know. But Mr. Bala, anyway, enjoy your videos, man. If you're one of his fans, let us know down in the comments. Check out Mr. Bala. Yeah, if you want to see more of his videos, let us know. Yeah. Hit that like button, subscribe, and share, and roll to 10k subscribers. We'll see you next time with me. Peace.